Hello YouTube. I recently came across a promo for a new book called Erasing Hell by Francis Chan, which appears to be a bit of an indirect rebuttal to the book Love Wins by Rob Bell. And I've chosen to make this video uh, because I don't think it's going to be necessary to purchase this book in order to find out what Francis Chan has to say about this topic and a variety of others. This is because Francis Chan is founder and chancellor of Eternity Bible College who has made a statement of faith available to the public. Now, a statement of faith which he probably helped formulate. So I'd like to read some selections from this. Uh, the preamble has to say, uh, Members of the College Board, administrators, and the faculty of EBC recognize that any statement of faith is a fallible attempt to summarize and systematize an infallible divine revelation. We recognize that the Bible is the Christian's only authoritative document. However, the Bible is often distorted and misinterpreted, so we believe that it is necessary not to add to what the Bible teaches, but instead to delineate what we believe the Bible means by what it teaches in several important areas. Thus, this statement of faith is essential because it provides an explanation of our understanding of what Scripture teaches and thereby provides the framework in which our curriculum and teaching occurs. Furthermore, it is acknowledged that there are contained within this statement doctrines which are essential, e.g. the deity of Christ, bodily resurrection, etc. The doctrine of bodily resurrection being essential is important and doctrines which are distinctives, e.g. spiritual gifts, last things, etc. Essentials are those doctrines which are universally held by the redeemed. Distinctives are those doctrines in which there has been latitude within historical Christianity. Being aware that all institutions continually face the danger of doctrinal drift, all members of the College Board, administration, and faculty of the College are required to sign a statement affirming their personal agreement with this statement of faith, including both essentials and distinctives, on an annual basis. So the statement of faith regarding the Holy Scriptures. We believe the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, the 66 canonical books, to be the verbally inspired Word of God, the final authority for faith and life, inerrant in the original writings, infallible, and God-breathed. So, they take the position that you know God literally told the authors of the Bible what specific words to write down. God has divinely preserved the Aramaic, Hebrew, and Greek texts so as to make his will explicitly known and obeyed. This conviction requires a literal, historical, and grammatical interpretation to the totality of Scripture. So, it's a requirement to interpret the entirety of Scripture literally. So, regarding the Son, we believe that the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for all mankind as a representative, vicarious, substitutionary sacrifice and that the sufficiency of this atoning sacrifice to accomplish the redemption and justification of all who trust in him is assured by his literal, physical resurrection from the dead. So, any other theories of atonement than penal substitution are unacceptable. Now, regarding man, we believe that man was directly and immediately created in the image and likeness of God, but that the transgression of Adam resulted in the condemnation of all men. All men are thus born spiritually dead and under the penalty of physical death. As a result of transgression, all men are born with an inherited sinful nature and are alienated from God. So he seems to take or at least this statement seems to take, you know, a somewhat Augustinian position that original sin is a kind of genetic guilt. Uh, we believe that man is totally depraved and utterly unable to remedy his lost condition. So this is the T of the Calvinist acronym TULIP. 
which naturally leads into the following statement regarding salvation. We believe that salvation is the gift of God brought to man by grace and received by faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ, whose precious blood was shed on Calvary for the forgiveness of our sins. So, you do have to wonder if they consider sola fide an essential. We believe that before the foundation of the world, God freely and graciously chose those individuals whom he would save. He did this based upon his own sovereign choice, and not based upon any foresight or anticipation of an individual's decision. The grace of God encompasses the gift of salvation and the means of receiving the gift. All and only those whom God the Father draws will come in faith. And all and only those who come in faith will be received by the Father. So I refer to this as the magic hat doctrine. So before the beginning of time, God picked certain people's names out of a magic hat, and they are the ones who he chose to save. Continuing, we believe that God's sovereign choice does not contradict or negate man's responsibility for his actions in any way. Man is completely responsible for his decisions and should be honestly called upon to repent and trust Christ as Savior and Lord. Even if you were one of the people whose name wasn't picked out of the hat. We believe that justification is an act of God whereby he forensically declares righteous those who have faith in Christ alone. So anything other than a juridical view of sin is also unacceptable. Uh, this righteousness is completely independent of any virtue, merit, or good work of man, but is based upon faith alone. Justification involves both an imputation of the believer's sin to Christ and the imputation of God's righteousness to the believer. In this way, Paul can say that God is both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So, th this kind of seems to be directly attempting to refute the concept of infused grace, uh, which most Catholics and Orthodox would adhere to. Next, the standard for sexuality. I really enjoy how the different terms are grouped here. We believe that God has instituted the marriage union, made up of one man and one woman, and that any intimate sexual activity outside of that union is sin. We believe that any form of homosexuality, lesbianism, so which is a different concept, uh, bisexuality, bestiality, incest, fornication, adultery, and pornography are sinful perversions of God's holy standard. Now the next section regarding the church. As the three persons of the Trinity are co-equal, we believe that men and women are created equal in the sight of God, equal image bearers, equally sinful, equally redeemable, equal in Christ, equally morally responsible to God. Additionally, just as there are role distinctions within the Trinity, there are role distinctions in the church between men and women. There are role distinctions between men and women in the church which are to be celebrated and which in no way hinder or contradict this equality. So it cites uh, 1 Corinthians 11, which is the passage which says that uh, while prophesying, women are to have their head covered, and 1 Timothy chapter 2, which says that women are not to have authority over men, but are to remain silent. So those are the role distinctions which are to be celebrated and which in no way hinder or contradict the equality of men and women in the sight of God. Now, regarding the personality of Satan, we believe that Satan is a person, the author of sin, and the cause of the original fall. 
that he is the open and declared enemy of God and man, and that he shall be eternally punished in the lake of fire. You know, this seems awfully close to uh, ditheism, you know, where you have a good God and a bad God, you know, like Zoroastrianism, for example. Um, in fact, you know, in this doctrinal statement, uh, Satan is referred to as a person in exactly the same way that the Holy Spirit is referred to as a person. Just saying. And regarding the second advent of Christ, um, I think this is where they kind of stray from uh, typically Reformed theology. Um, the Reformed uh, wouldn't believe in a literal rapture, which is what this teaches. Uh, we believe in the personal, imminent, and premillennial coming of the Lord Jesus Christ for his redeemed ones and in his subsequent return to earth with his saints to establish his millennial kingdom. Now, what, when you pair that uh, with a literal interpretation of the totality of Scripture, uh, that seems very conducive to the creation of something like the Left Behind books. Now, the most important part of the doctrinal statement for this video is the death, resurrection, and the eternal state, which was considered an essential doctrine, something which all the redeemed adhere to. We believe in the bodily resurrection of all men, the saved to eternal life, and the unsaved to judgment and everlasting punishment. We believe that at death, the souls of the redeemed are absent from the body and present with the Lord, where in conscious bliss they await the resurrection of the church to be glorified forever with the Lord. We believe that after death, the souls of unbelievers remain in conscious misery until the second resurrection when they shall appear at the great white throne judgment and shall be cast into the lake of fire, not to be annihilated, but to suffer everlasting conscious punishment. That's pretty straightforward. And that's why I think, based upon this doctrinal statement, which Francis Chan would have had to approve that it's not necessary to read his book to find out what he has to say regarding the topic of the doctrine of hell. So, he believes that all the redeemed must believe in everlasting conscious punishment. 